Okay, please open your Bibles to Psalms chapter 2, Psalms chapter 2, the second psalm, and uh, as always most scripture has at least two parts to it, historical and prophetical, on top of that doctrinal and spiritual. But Psalm 2, in verse 1 it says, why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing, which is quoted back in the book of Acts, concerning the leaders that rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was interesting because they were Jews, referred to as being heathen which shows how far they'd fallen from grace. Look at two. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The kings of the earth, Caiaphas, Pilate, the Sanhedrin, set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Partly pitched at the first coming, as I say, with the leaders in Jerusalem who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and against his anointed saying, comma, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Also has an eschatological connotation to this. The term Lord here is uppercase to denote God the Father and against his anointed being the Christos, the Christ, being Jesus of course, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You've got, on the one hand, a picture here of the Jews and the Gentiles during the first coming of the Lord coming together to conspire against the Lord's ministry plotting got kings plural from verse 2 rule is plural taking counsel against the lord and against his anointed the whole point of course was to thwart the lord's first coming which will be repeated the second coming look at verse uh, 4 he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh the lord shall have them in derision that term derision is a wild kind of a laugh that word uh, derision is like the joker the joker's laugh in the batman movies <coughs> It's a wild kind of laugh, and I'm going to call this message One Second From Hell, because if you're not born again, you are one second from hell. You are a step from hell. On top of that, if you're not saved, you have nothing to be laughing about. But if you're saved, you can rejoice in the Lord. You can be very thankful. You can enjoy a good meal. You can enjoy fellowship like we are today. You can enjoy life to some extent. And yet, millions of people all over the world are watching television every night, going to theatre shows, football stadiums, sport events, what have you, having a great time. And yet, the one step, one moment, one second from hell. And here, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, picturing almighty God, of course. The Lord shall have them in derision. When I think about these verses, I think about uh, Philippians chapter 2, how every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I heard a message some years ago that when... The unsaved are judged before they are sent to hell to burn. They have to go down their knees and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And the preacher said that when that is happening, they say Jesus Christ is Lord. Almighty God, and this text seems to imply it, shall have them in derision. It's like a wild kind of a laugh. As if to say, all those years you mocked me, you blasphemed my son, you took his name as a filth word, you put Jesus Christ superstar out, you thought he was something to make fun of. And now it's my time to almost laugh in your face. Come back to that thought. Look at verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. It has to be the great white throne in judgment. This is not in reference to carnal Christians. This is very much in reference to the second coming, going into the great white throne in judgment. At least I believe anyway. 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. My king, king of the Jews, Jesus Christ, my holy hill of Zion. Jerusalem the eternal city, get your hands off it. It doesn't belong to the Catholics, it doesn't belong to the Muslims, it belongs to the Jews. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The Lord, uppercase, hath said to me, or unto me. You've got God the Father, speaking to God the Son. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. What was that day? When was that day? When did this occur? I think probably at the Incarnation. I think from Isaiah, there are seven references to God the Father speaking to God the Son, and God the Son speaking to God the Father. And you can't get anywhere near that in the Quran. I will declare the decree, this is going to happen, listen to me. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. And yet Islam says, God had no son. Which is true, Allah had no son. In fact, they say that if you say that Allah has a son, you are cursed. And the word of God says that he that hath a son hath life. And he that hath not a son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth upon him. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Incarnation, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. 
that's a church, comma, and the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. Second coming, the millennial reign. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He comes the first time as the son of Joseph, and they crucify him. He comes the second time as the son of David, and he puts his enemies down. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. The warning goes out to allow people to repent. Although God knows through his foreknowledge who will and who will not be saved, he still gives people the chance to be saved. It's like over in Revelation, don't take the mark of the beast. And people say, well, would a saved person take the mark of the beast? Of course, the answer is no. So then why tell people not to take the mark of the beast? Well, in the Gospels, the Lord said to the Pharisees, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? So the offer was given even to the Pharisees to be saved. Although he knew through foreknowledge they wouldn't be saved, he still grants them repentance. He still allows them the chance to be saved. And the same is true of the mark of the beast in the tribulation. He's saying to those in tribulation, whatever you do, don't take that mark of the beast. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Fear is a good thing. It's good to fear the Lord. It keeps you on your toes. It stops you from sinning. It stops you from drying up. But you shouldn't be paralyzed by fear. We shouldn't be paralyzed when it comes to Almighty God. We can approach Almighty God through Jesus Christ. We don't need to go through some third party. The scripture says that Jesus Christ is our older brother. Serve the Lord, uppercase, with fear. I think from memory that word Lord in um, Hebrew is Elohim. And Elohim is plural and also singular. So you could say that is a picture of the Trinity of God or the Trinity of God. Serve the Trinity of God with fear and rejoice with trembling. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Kiss the Son lest he be angry and he perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Kiss the son, submit to the son. And yet Judas came along and kissed the son of man. And we call that the kiss of death. And he said to uh, Judas, have you come to betray me? In fact, he calls Judas friend. And the word of God says how he came to lay his life down for his friends. He died for Judas. He died for the false prophets, the false teachers from Second Peter 2, 1. He died for all of us here this morning. He even died for the devil. And yet the devil can't be redeemed. It's a picture of reversing what went wrong in the garden. Maybe come back to that thought in a minute. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. But my overall verse from this piece of scripture is from Psalm 2, 4. He that sitteth in the heavens, third heaven, shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. It's a picture of the Lord mocking, almost antagonizing the unsaved dead because they have rejected his beloved son, and they've got their comeuppance. Go to... Let's see now. Uh, Proverbs, please. Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1. Scripture with scripture. Proverbs chapter 1. Look at 23, please. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I pour out my spirits unto you. I make known my words unto you. There's a picture of provision. There's a picture of the Lord allowing people to enjoy his fellowship, to be a part of who he is. Because I've called and you refused. I've stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. I'll also laugh at your calamity, I'll mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Let's break this down. 24. Because I have called, there's provision, there's a picture of repentance. Come unto me, all that labour and heavy laden, I'll give you rest, okay? Because I have called, and ye refused. You won't come to me that you might have life. Not that you can't come to me, but that you won't come to me that you might have life. And the context here is actually to Israel, to be doctrinally correct. But we can spiritualize it to the church age, and we are going to do that for this morning. Because I have called, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And you refuse. No, we won't come to you. We're pretty okay on our own. We're pretty holy. We've got our own way of doing things. We have Mary. We have the Mass. We have Muhammad. We have Confucius. We have Buddha. I've stretched out my hand. And no man regarded completely disregarded it, completely indifferent. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. That's why the prophets were sent to Israel from, let's see now, First uh, Samuel 8 to Malachi chapter 4, preaching to the Jews. Repent, get right with God. Jonah was sent to the people of Nineveh. Repent, there's going to be a judgment. And they repented, the people of Nineveh, modern day Iraq. They repented. Pagan Gentiles, the Jews were wicked. I think it's Ezekiel chapter 8. They're doing awful things in their temple. And we go through the church uh, era. We get the same picture of sinners refusing to repent. Sinners thinking that they can do their own thing. 
sinners thinking that they are holy, that they are righteous, they don't need a saviour. And he goes and say, but you have set all my counsel, you would have none of my reproof. You thought you knew best, you were completely indifferent, you were rejecting my light. And we know also from uh, Romans chapter 1 how there is light, universal light, which is given to the world. And that light is there for a purpose, so that when people die and stand at the great white throne judgment, they can't say that God didn't die for them. They can't say they weren't aware that there was a light because God gave them a light. They've got a conscience, they've got churches, they've got cemeteries, which point to death that give a very clear picture as to what will happen to people who die without Jesus Christ. Look at 26 first of all. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Just picture that. I also will laugh at your calamity. You're in a meltdown. You've died, you're lost, you're like the rich man in hell. Luke chapter 16. And here God is speaking. This is God speaking. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. And people say God is a God of love. Yes. He is a God of love if you love him, if you are in Christ. But if you're not in Christ, if you don't love him, this is what's going to happen to you. Look at 27. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. You can't imagine it, can you? This is Almighty God. He sat back for millenniums. He's watched people come and go. He's observed some wicked things from the third heaven. And for the most part, he's kept quiet. For the most part, he's been long-suffering. For the most part, he's almost wept over what he has experienced. 28. Then shall they call upon me, like Acts 16, send Lazarus to dip some water in my tongue. But I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, I did not choose the fear of the Lord. They were none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. Daniel 12 says that if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you will experience everlasting shame and contempt. Bad enough that you've missed the Saviour, it's bad enough that you've died in your sins, but on top of that, you take all of your sins into the lake of fire which burns forever. 31. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. You reap what you sow, you made your own bed, you lie in it. 32. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. For whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Psalm 2, Proverbs 1, makes it very clear that not only are you one second from hell, but when you die, this is what awaits you. Fear will come upon you, destruction, distress. You're going to call upon him, but as they say in the world, too little, too late. You've missed the boat. And yet, according to Matthew 25, hell wasn't made for mankind. It was made for the devil and his angels. Why would you go to hell? Why would you pass up on this great gift of everlasting life? Go to Psalm 37, please. Psalm 37. And I appreciate this isn't a particularly popular message. I do appreciate that. And yet, Christ preached on hell three times every year throughout his ministry. Psalm 37, Psalm 37, look at verse 13, please. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. You can't miss it, can you? It's three parts of the Old Testament, picturing Almighty God around the time of the great white throne judgment, laughing at unrepentant, wicked, evil people. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation he's going to laugh at you he's going to mock you he's going to destroy you people say well this is old testament james and we don't really know if hell is forever well if heaven is referred to as being forever why wouldn't hell be referred to as being forever go to uh let's see now go to luke chapter 15 please there's a scripture in the gospels which says don't fear him that can kill the body but fear him that can kill body and soul in hell Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And in Luke chapter 15, there's an interesting scripture here, which gets overlooked by people who, who reject hell. Luke 15, look, if you will, at verse 17, please. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? You can perish with hunger and not starve to death. So you can perish and still not be burnt up. You can perish and not be annihilated. And here you've got a picture of the 
prodigal son, he's perishing, he's starving, and yet he doesn't starve. So the term perish doesn't mean to be put out of your uh, existence. It's a good picture here of hell being forever. You believe on the sun, you're saved. You don't believe on the sun, you perish. But that doesn't mean you cease from existing. You're still going to be existing either in heaven or in hell because your soul is eternal. And here this man is perishing with hunger, and yet one more time, he doesn't starve. It's a picture there of perishing and not being annihilated. Go back to the Old Testament, please. There's a well-known um, scholar whose name escapes me, and he wrote a book called The Unquenchable Fire, I think. And he's now trying to argue, he's not the only one, that hell isn't eternal. That when you die, you just cease to exist. Wouldn't that be nice? You've had a wicked life, you've done your own thing, and when you die, you just go out of existence. And this guy, whose name escapes me, is now teaching that hell isn't really forever. It starts off pretty bleak. You start off burning, and this book has influenced a lot of pastors. And I was talking to a Calvinist pastor about 18 months ago, who's pretty conservative, and even he was insinuating that he can no longer defend everlasting hell because of people such as this well-known scholar arguing that hell isn't forever and yet Luke makes it clear that you can perish with hunger and not end up dying of starvation you can perish in hell and not be annihilated you can destroy someone's testimony and yet they still are alive sometimes a basic understanding of English words gets lost in many people Psalm 2 verse 4 one more time he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh Great white throne judgment, it has to be, the Lord uppercase shall have them in derision. We know from John chapter 5 that all judgment has been given to God the Son. So when an unsaved man dies, he slash she will be judged by Jesus Christ. And if my text is clear here to me this morning, and I think it is, you're going to have Jesus Christ laughing in people's faces. You can't imagine that, can you? He wept over Jerusalem. It says how he stretches out his arm all day long to again same people. It says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And yet scripture with scripture tells me that Jesus Christ, based on John chapter 5, shall have them in derision. Not just a ha ha ha. This is a wild laugh. Like I say, the character comes to mind, uh, the Joker from the Batman movie. And this is an awful thought. And I wouldn't be surprised after a million years in hell or a billion years in hell, that that wild laugh echoes from the third heaven. I wouldn't be surprised. Kiss the sun, twelve, lest you be angry, and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but a little. Don't abuse grace. He's still in the business of saving people. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him, like we have. Proverbs 1. And like I say, this isn't a popular subject to preach on, and yet... The Old Testament and the New Testament speaks about hell so many times you can't possibly miss it unless you are blind and you don't want to see it. 24, because I have called and you refused. You've got the sovereignty of, uh, sovereignty of God and you've got the free will of man running side by side. And this is what Calvin could never get straight. You've got God's sovereignty and you've got man's free will. And somehow they marry up. Because I have called and you refused. I've offered you everlasting life, but you wouldn't come to me that you might have life. I've stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. Very much found in the book of Romans, chapter 10. But ye have set all my noughts at council, and with none of my reproof. Now that the Sanhedrin are partly pictured here, concerning the Lord's first coming, I also will laugh at your calamity. You know, meltdown, you're panicking, you're at your lowest. On top of that, I will mock when your fear cometh. This has got to be the great white throne judgment, but on top of that, I'm thinking to myself, this could also be in reference to the great tribulation. We know from Second Thessalonians chapter 2 that God will send out strong delusion on those that refuse to believe the truth, that they have pleasure in unrighteousness. But you have said all my counsel, but I have none of my reproof. I will laugh when your calamity comes, mock when your fear comes, so on and so forth. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. We've got a picture of people calling upon him. Lord, save me. It's 1945. We're burning in Auschwitz. Lord, save me. We're in Dachau. We've been hung up by a piano wire. Lord, save me. We're in Stalin's gulags. Lord, save me. We are the chosen people. But you said, let his blood be on us 
and on our children. He said, we have no king but Caesar. Then shall they call upon me. Lord save me, it's 1944, it's Belson. We're burning in ovens, we're starving. We're having to eat our children, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. And yet some Jews got saved during the Holocaust, but not many. Most Jews today are atheists. Most Jews today are agnostic. Most Jews today have no time for God. For that, they hated knowledge, being God and his word, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They put the Son of God on a cross. They conspired with the Pharisees and the uh, Gentile leaders, Herod, Pilate, which, if that isn't high treason, I don't know what is. They were none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. They spat on Christ. They beat him. They put a crown of thorns in his head. They put a purple robe on him. They cast Lots to decide who would get his robe. They said, uh, if he is the son of God, let him come down from the cross and save himself. And that term, the wandering Jew, comes to my mind. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way. 70 AD, Titus surrounds Jerusalem. And Titus told his soldiers, whatever you do, don't destroy the temple. Because it's one of the seven wonders of the earth. And what happened? Some zealous soldier torched the temple. And the temple went down, but before he torched the temple, before he pulled the temple down, Matthew 24, there was a siege which lasted for months, and you've got women eating their children, and I mean eating their children, to survive. How many parents could imagine that? But it happened, and those Jews that survived that siege, like Stalingrad, 1941, were taken to other parts of the Roman Empire to be slaves to Rome. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way. You're going to eat your children, you're going to wander for 2,000 years. You're going to go into concentration camps. If the Nazis don't kill you, communists will, and be filled with their own devices. You're going to wander, you're going to wander, you're going to wander until 1948 when it pleases the Lord to put you back in Israel. And once you go back into Israel in 1948, you're going to stay put. you never leave Israel, and you'll stay in Israel until the Messiah comes back. And when he comes back, over a third of the Jews will receive him as their Messiah. But before that happens, 31, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. It's going to be hard. You're going to be despised. You won't be trusted. The Catholic Church are going to um, round you up. They're going to put you to death. They're going to make you wear uh, yellow bonnets around your neck to show people you are a Jew. The Third Reich are going to come along and make you wear a Star of David. Of course, you know, most of the Third Reich leaders were Catholic. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely. Whoso listens to me, whosoever believes on me, shall dwell safely. Whoever repents, whoever trusts in me, shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. It's a picture of redemption. There's a picture there of being saved. There's a picture there of coming to the Saviour receive everlasting life and uh, one final time from Psalm 37 to recap due to the outside noise and uh, my apologies this was a live recording if you happen to be listening to this on the radio or wherever you are in the world uh, Psalm 37 scripture for scripture so you don't uh, miss what I've been trying to explain this morning Psalm 37 Psalm 37 I'll get there shortly Written by King David, a type of Christ, 1000 AD, Psalm 37, 13. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. Great white throne judgment. Let's spiritualize this over the last 3000 years from 1000 uh, BC up until the second advent. The wicked, unsaved Jews in the context here, but let's spiritualize it to unsaved Gentiles, have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow going around killing innocent people, to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. The wicked are going to be in charge, the wicked are going to be calling the shots, and the wicked are the ones that put the good people down. And if that wasn't bad enough, Luke chapter 15, Jesus Christ speaks about the prodigal son. And in Luke chapter 15, it says in verse 17, and When he came to himself, there's another picture of repentance, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. You can perish with hunger, but that doesn't mean that you cease to exist. That doesn't mean you starve to death. You can perish in your sins. You can perish in hell forever, but that doesn't mean you're going to burn up. 
it means you're going to hell forever and you suffer in hell forever. There's no getting away from it. Hell is forever. Hell is an awful place. Hell is a place of weeping and nailing, weeping and gnashing, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth, wailing as well. And if you die without Christ, hell awaits you. And what else can I say? This is what the Word of God teaches. And for those which are saved, to those which believe the Word of God, we were told to preach the whole counsel of God. So what was good yesterday was the gospel to be saved by faith in Christ alone, praise the Lord. But if you reject that, if you turn it down, then hell awaits you. And according to the scriptures which we looked at this morning, the Lord himself is going to laugh in your face. He's going to mock when your calamity comes. You're going to call upon him. And as the world say, it's going to be too little, too late. And I don't know what else to say other than repent, turn to the Savior, trust in him, believe on him. And if you do that, you are promised, present tense, everlasting life. But uh, as it says in the book of Hebrews, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God.